Ladies and gentlemen, this is the very first episode of The O Spot with Miss Ona Z. I'm Timothy Beal, Miss Ona Z's manager and the moderator for the show. So I want to start you guys off on a backdrop of who she is as a performer. So Miss Ona, uh, let the audience know how you started, um, where you're from, first of all, and how you got involved in uh, entertainment. Well, first of all, thank you for mm -hmm. being here and thank you, Tim. I love you very much. Thank you. We've worked very, very hard for a long time on this, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm from Los Angeles. I'm a native, second generation, if you can believe it. And um, I started in the business in 80, 88 or 89. And those were the silver years. The gold years were already gone. And it was fantastic. I mean, there was a small group of people, an entourage of people, and we all knew each other and we had a great time together. We shot in San Francisco because it was illegal to shoot in Los Angeles, as Tim knows. And, um, you know, I had been a, a legitimate actress and a model and all that. And I always, wanted to experience this and i had married a man who wanted to be in the adult business and the only way for him to get in was through a woman that's the way you know men get into the business is through their girlfriend or their wife mm -hmm. so i went to meet uh the manager uh the top manager in the business jim self and he looked at me and he said i don't know you know you might be too old i was like 30 something and i said okay fine never mind i'll, I'll figure it out and just at that moment a uh, producer walked in english producer and he said oh my god you're perfect to play joanna collins and uh in dallas and i said <laughs> okay. I said, see, Jim, somebody loves me. And that started me off. And we went to San Francisco and shot for about six days. I had never made that much money. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, which I'll get into later on in the show or other shows as they progress. Um, and that And that started me off in my career. And I knew instantly that this, I could be the best at this. I could be really, really good. And um, I booked a lot, I booked every day. Sometimes I did three scenes a day, sometimes six scenes a day. And it didn't seem to bother me. I had a lot of sexual energy. And um, the money got bigger. And after, mm -hmm. after just a few years, I realized that the big money was in production. So I set my sight on that, but in order to get there, I had to dance. All the girls went out and danced on the road. So I danced 30 weeks a year, five hours a day. I missed Christmas, birthday, this, that, and the other, but it was the only thing that was important to me was how to get to make my own company. And after several years, I did, it was very tough very tough. And I started with a line called, um, what well, was Ona Z Productions, and I started with a bondage line called Learning the Ropes. And that, to this day, is the best bondage line ever made. Um, and, the, and the business grew very quickly. And I ended up, you know, making a lot of money, making a lot of movies, um, and, and along the way, really loving it. I, I had that business for over 25 years and I quit when 
you know, people began cheating, lying. They, you know, um, newcomers would come in and just, you know, sell the tape for like $2. And I, I couldn't make any more money. So I got out. And uh, in the meantime, I've been working with Tim on this podcast, and we're also writing a book. I'm writing a book. I'm writing a book about how to get out of the business because so many women and men have killed themselves trying instead of trying to get out of the business. I had a plan. I'm pretty sharp. And I had a plan. I said, okay, I'm going to do this, this, and this. I've been in the business 30 years. I'm going to build my business. I'm going to make this amount of money. I'm going to have an annuity. And I do. And I'm going to invest in real estate, which I did and I have done. And I'm going to, you know, write a book, uh, do movies, do some other things that really interest me. And I'm just about there. So with Tim's help, I'm writing a book about how not to kill yourself. You can get out of the business if you want to, but you have to have a plan. And it's hard for most of the women that come in because they're young, they're on drugs, and they don't know what to do. So having said all that, I mean, there's a lot more I could say, and I will say, but I'd really like to hear from you if you're out there, if you have questions, if you have comments, if there's something you want to know, I want to talk to you. So I want to talk about like your very, very beginnings, because a lot of women that were scouted for the adult industry just got into the adult industry. And that was their first experience in front of the camera or behind the camera for that matter. So you were a legitimate model for the, I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, the Wellheima uh, Talent Agency. Wellamina. 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 So how did that process go? Like, how were you scouted for that company as a model? As a child, I was very beautiful. And I became a model very easily. Mm -hmm. People, my, it, it just happened in my arena growing up and people wanted to take my picture. So I started with Wilhelmina, but then I went to uh, Fran O'Brien and she booked me almost every single day and I'm small. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to be booked in print every day is a lot. I had a contract with NBC. I was thinking about this the other day and uh, JC Penny for shoes. I did a lot of tennis stuff. I was an advocate, uh, tennis player, golf player, swimmer, whatever activity. That's what I like to do. And um, so, uh, how did I get in? Is that what you said? Well, did you I'm have, losing it. Like, did you have family members in the entertainment industry? No, I don't. Okay. And I, I really think my mother always wanted to be an actress. Mm -hmm. So she pushed me in that direction. And then about when I was about 20 years old, you know, there used to be in Los Angeles dance clubs, the Daisy, stuff like that. So I used to go dancing every night. And some people from Playboy approached me. And I did some mag magazine work for Playboy. I also did centerfold for Playboy, but I was a year too young. So they, they pulled it. But I had already established a great relationship with Playboy. And getting naked wasn't a big deal for me. My first naked scene or sex scene was with Tom Byron. Mm -hmm. and, and I was used to the camera. I mean, it, it didn't scare me. I knew what to do. And I've been doing it since I've been 10 or 11 years old modeling. And we had all these cameramen around and there was Tom Byron. He was so young and we, we had sex and, you know, it was a little scary at first. And then I got into it and I forgot about everybody that was around. And when I finished, they applauded, which was great. And then the cameraman said, you've done this before. I said, no, I've never done it before. Well, how do you know what to do? I said, because it's natural. You just know what to do. You're having sex and you have sex like if the camera's not there. And they kept telling me, no, you've done it before. You've done it before. And honestly, I had never done it before, but I really enjoyed it. And um, I will tell you that as a teenager, I had been incested. And that promoted me 
to be in the business and to take control of my own sex life. And that was a great feeling to take back control and to make a living at it, to get paid for it and not just to have to have it taken from me. And the more I did it, the better I liked it. The more money I made, the better I felt about myself. I'm, I did a lot of therapy. Um, and that helped me a lot. But this that principle had a lot to do with it. And I know most of the women that come in experience the exact same thing. And men experience the exact same thing. So it's an impetus to doing better, making more money, making more movies. So let's go back to your Playboy uh, photo shoot Experience. because that's that's interesting. I'm sure it's interesting to a lot of people too. So do you remember anything about your photo shoot? Yeah, I remember everything. It was in it was in the winter. It was like in February. It was before my 18th birthday. Mm -hmm. My birthday's March 3rd. I was 17, and I had already done some nude modeling, mm -hmm. and. We went up to either Arrowhead or Big Bear and it was snowing and I was wearing like a furry thing like they used to do. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, modeling nude. I mean, you know, legs open and all this stuff for Centerfold and they loved it and I loved it. And somehow or other they found out I was 17 and they had to pull them, but they used them later mm -hmm. everywhere. It was a great disappointment to me, mm -hmm. although Many years later, I did Centerfold, Penthouse, Hustler, all of those magazines. And I had an opportunity at that time to travel to Africa, um, Australia for, for Hustler, and stay at uh, Guccione's house in New York. So in a way, I really didn't lose that much. Um, when I started making movies, Penthouse, um, Playboy, mm -hmm. was the first company who bought them. They bought everything um, because we had a great relationship. Mm -hmm. So I'm very grateful for that. But they're still around. I mean, they're still in Playboy somewhere. Um, I just didn't get to be centerfold, which was kind of a drag. But, you know, they bought everything I made, which was really, really good. So you started working for the mainstream talent modeling agency. When I was 12. And then the process of being recruited or scouted for Playboy, um, is that something that you pursued or no. somebody took pictures of you and suggested that you could be in Playboy or how did, how did that process From go? the agency, mm -hmm. um, one of the agencies, I was, first of all, I'm, I'm a really fiery, go get it, A type person. Mm -hmm. And I was given a list in those days that they gave you, if you're renew, a list of photographers. It was your job to go around and knock on doors and say, Hey, I'm Ona. I want to work, you know, call me if something comes up. And I, I, because I was so aggressive, I got a lot of work. I went day after day after day. And one of the photographers I worked for was someone who was really on the edge, who was doing can't say nudie magazines, but some professionally shot girl on girl stuff, really beautiful stuff. And I started working for him and he recommended me to Playboy. Okay. And that's how it got started. And then, you know, I would go to um, the dance clubs or whatever at night. And a lot of Playboy people were there mm -hmm. and they roped me in. And it was fine because I was really happy to work for Playboy and stuff like that. I did not get an opportunity to go to college, which was fine. Um, I, I worked. I worked in, you know, retail clothing while I wasn't uh, modeling. And then um, at, at 22 or something, I got my real estate license. So I was always working, whether it was modeling, real estate, clothing, whatever it was but modeling was my favorite i really had a great time and i and i print very well i look really good in print so did you get a chance to go to the actual playboy mansion oh yeah many many and you met Hugh Zeffner? yeah mm -hmm. and you know a lot of people didn't like him and i never had any desire to be you know his bunny mm -hmm. or stay overnight or anything like that and we were friends and he appreciated how hard i was working and the fact that I was, you know, a businesswoman and he wanted 
to play with the girls. He mm -hmm. wanted those blonde bunnies. And it just wasn't my style. He did ask me if I wanted to work in a club. And mm -hmm. I said, no, I really want to do my own thing. But thank you so much for asking me. Mm -hmm. And he was he was very nice to me. He, he, you know, with his pajamas and his shtick and whatever it is that he was doing, it was fine. I mean, I went to the parties. And then when I became successful with my company, I didn't go to the parties. But I stayed in touch with him. Mm -hmm. and let him know, especially when he bought my shows, how much I appreciated that. And the person that he had um, hired to buy the movies from distributors um, was told to buy them from me first. Okay. And I you know, wrote him a really nice letter and I said, I really appreciate that. And he goes, well, you're doing really good work and I, I want to support you. And he did. I mean, I made two or 300 movies, he bought them all. Mm, wow. Yeah, he's a very nice person to me. And a lot of people don't say that. Oh. Tired of that same old, same old breakfast, lunch and dinner, same old tasting scrambled eggs, burger, that dinner steak, ribs or pork chops. Why not add a little bit of spice or just a touch of heat to make the difference. Change that scrambled egg with a little bit of Johnny Fabulous's John Cena Sr.'s Million Dollar Jalapeno Hot Sauce. Great on burgers, steaks, chops, and those barbecued ribs. The Monty and the Farrow Show is brought to you by because wine is your second favorite four-letter word. California wine, New York attitude, good fucking wine. Yeah. In the mood for a freshly roasted cup of coffee? www.offtherailscoffeeroasters.com mansion um producing her first few films for playboy being part of the magazine um later on but um actually got edited out because of she was 17 years old when she did the photo shoot which is interesting um what i found out is actually a lot of playboy centerfolds were actually underage prior to doing their shoots and then later on their photos came out after they were over age right so case in point i don't know if you knew her or not but um one of the most tragic stories of playboy is the dorothy stratton story oh my gosh and i don't know if you know her or knew her or had any interaction with her at all um uh, do share any of that yeah. oh i'm sorry i um didn't know dorothy stratton i knew about her mm -hmm. And it is really a tragic story. Tim, the thing about Dorothy Stratton is that she's not alone, mm -hmm. um, which is why we've talked about writing a book for so long. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tim is so busy and I am not as as busy. I was, but then I, um, I got lung cancer a couple of years ago. And so my lovely, beautiful Tim has hung in there with me. Um, a lot of women experience what she did mm -hmm. and it is a tragedy mm -hmm. it's a horrible tragedy and my hope is that no one else has to experience it right and like i you know i was fortunate to know seika mm -hmm. and a lot of those women from the golden era and they were hard those women were hard and we were i remember being on the sally jesse Raphael show i don't know if any of you out there remember her but she was a bitch and i'm sitting next to seika and here i am like green around the gills i you know this is like one of my first talk shows mm -hmm. and it's they had a pitchfork audience and that is a setup audience where you know we're talking about how much we enjoy having sex for a living mm -hmm. and the audience is set up to boo or say horrible things or that we're sluts or whatever we are and i'm thinking to myself who are these people? Mm -hmm. You know, give us a chance to say something. Mm -hmm. And Sega is sitting next to me and she's like, 
you know, <laughs> don't say anything. And right. I'm like, why not? I've got, you know, the big mouth. And so Sally Jesse is berating us. And finally I said, I stood up and I said, what is this about? Mm -hmm. I thought we were here to talk about, you know, a business that we're in that we're enjoying. And Sally was like, there's no way you can enjoy it. And what do you people think? And I, 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 Isika like pulled me down in my chair and she said, I told you, mm -hmm. don't say anything. Because all those shows in that, during that time, I guess that was the early nineties, were set up to make us look really bad. Mm -hmm. And one of my very, very good friends, um, who owns Doc Johnson, he 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 said several things one thing that just stuck with me forever is about being in the in the making you know your own company is when the bell goes off you better be there from mm -hmm. the beginning to the end well not only was i there from the beginning but i was there 24 7 and he was right and i do have you know products with him we'll be opening our own store mm -hmm. um uh, with approval of my friend Ron um, and having our own thing. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Dorothy Stratton was not, she was the first, mm -hmm. but she wasn't alone. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, it, and it's still prevalent today. So from the time you're 17 years old, having done your modeling shoot for Playboy, um, those formative years after that, what was your life like? Were you still modeling with the top modeling agency, Wilhelmina agency, or what was your, your years from 17 on like? Well, I, as I said, I got my real estate license. I am always one to do a, a lot of things. I was working in, real, in a retail business. I did very well, but I was also uh, modeling. I did, you know, they used to call it tea room modeling. So you'd go to, used to be Bullock's, Wilshire downtown. And I would, even though I was like five, five and a half or whatever, I would do, you know, you wear the clothes that you can sell and you'd walk around or whatever. I still did a lot of regular modeling and um, I, I was an artist. Mm -hmm. So I went to like a night school at UCLA mm -hmm. and um, I love to draw and paint and do stuff like that. So really big learning years for me. And um, I didn't get, like I said, I didn't get into adult until I was 33 or 34. So that's really important for the audience to know out there that at the time that Ona entered into the adult film industry, she was actually the oldest female promote performer at that time to enter into the business. Everybody else was like 20, okay. young, 20, 19, 18. So what was that process? You're doing feature dancing. Um, do you just say to yourself one day, I can do this? Like you were a fan of adult films and you wanted to break into that industry or how was that process? My ex-husband, Frank, he, when we got together, he, we would go down to San Diego for vacation or whatever, and he'd bring all these adult films and we'd watch them. The thing that got me was there were all these films on Canadian dancers. Mm -hmm. And I am a dancer mm -hmm. from the time I was a kid. I love to dance. And that got me. Mm -hmm. That is what did it. That was the key. And we'd watch these dancers and I said, that's what I want to do. He said, well, you got to make films and go dance. And I said, well, I'll do whatever I have to do. Mm -hmm. And that is the part that I absolutely loved. And so, so sorry that it's over because for me being a dancer, it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And, um, in order to build my company, I had to go out and get my name done. So I known, so I had to go all around the country several times mm -hmm. and um you know there was another girl i think ashlyn gear was older than she said she was i don't know where she is now i think she's in las vegas um she didn't like me very much i didn't have anything here or there about her but uh, i think she felt competitive with me so um yes i was 
probably one of the oldest people ever to get into adult, but that was good mm -hmm. because I kind of made my bones in other places mm -hmm. and I knew how to handle it. I wasn't terrified. The business can be terrifying because of the producers, mm -hmm. you know, because of the business, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. And um, because I was older, I knew how to handle it mm -hmm. and I learned how to handle it. And then I, what they did to me, I turned around and did to them. And, th and that was frightening. So how did you find out that where to contact the producers? Like, was there a publication you could go to at that time to look up adult films that were in production or casting or how was the well, casting? Well, they were the, um, the Americas, which there were like seven of them. And I did ask, and when I first went in to interview with one of the production companies, he said to me, I think you're in the wrong place. You don't want a job here. I said, no, I want to be an actor. And he said, oh, okay, let me send you to, again to Jim South. Mm -hmm. And I said, ah, okay, because I didn't know Jim South from a donut. Right. So that's when I went over to meet him and he, he ended up being a very good friend. Mm -hmm. um, right before he died, he called me and he said, I want to let you know you're one of the people that I have loved most in my life. Mm -hmm. and, and that was big. And um, we, we became really, really good friends because I know he thought, oh my God, this woman's too old. She'll never work. And I, you know, I have won like 30 awards from the hot door to the AVN and, you know, one day I won six awards one year and I brought him in and I said, well, <laughs> now what do you think? And he said, I'm proud of you. I, I can't believe it. I said, I know you like those 15 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> I said, they give good, they give good head dancing. He said, yeah, they do, but you must do something special. I don't know. So, um, yeah, so. That's that. So when you entered into the business, did you have an agent or you just were doing the deals yourself? Jim or? South. Okay, Jim South. You could not get okay. around him which way or forwards or backwards. And then when I started producing, I chose my own talent. Okay. But a lot of those girls said, no, I'm with Jim South. And I went, fuck. All right. Because he chose, he got a pretty penny for them. So instead of trying to get around him, I just called him and said, look, I hired this, 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 and this. What do I owe you? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was so much easier. So when you started, were there any rules they applied to you? Like you were going to just do these type of scenes or were you just entering into the business with the open mind that you were going to be available for all types of scenes? That yes, I made myself available. And obviously I wasn't going to be a milkmaid of 13, but I, I knew what I wanted to produce. I wanted to produce real films and I did a set of film noir that were just gorgeous and, and like, 10 times more expensive than anything that was out. And they sold really well internationally. And I was chosen to do films for acting mm -hmm. and for sex, mm -hmm. but definitely for acting. And I remember one time John Leslie put me in this film that won all kinds of awards. And he said, I was friends with this makeup artist. And mm -hmm. he said, well, we'll just do a little makeup. And John heard it and he blew through the door. And he said, not one stitch of makeup on her. Mm -hmm. And I said, John, please. He said, no, this is a really serious role. It was, it was the film that um, Humphrey Bogart did. Oh, you would know it. I just saw it. They were on a desert island mm -hmm. with, um, you would know it anyway. And the girl has to sing. And oh. so I had to do all of that and no makeup. And he did this to me twice. And I won for it, but I said to him when I was winning, was it really worth it? Right. Really? No. I really like makeup. It wasn't worth it. But um, the producers, these guys, John, Leslie, and the other guys, they really, really admired me and respected me. It took a while because it was the old boys club. 
and they didn't really want to let anybody in. But I'll tell you what, Tim, we'd go to the CES show, I'd have my booth, mm -hmm. and every single one of them, a lot of them would come over and just, you know, shake my hand and give me a hundred grand. Mm -hmm. Have a great show. Mm -hmm. Have a great show. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, well, I think it would be better now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Totally get that one. Um, so, but let's talk about actually the way that films in the adult industry used to be produced. So a lot of people don't realize is that back in Ona's era or genre of films that she was doing, the adult films were actually produced on 35 millimeter film. Oh yeah. And a lot of those were on the back of Disney films. Mm -hmm. So Disney would throw out their films and we would go get them and produce, would film on the back of them. So every once in a while, you see Mickey Mouse in the middle of something. <laughs> You'd be like, <laughs> Mickey? But um, eventually we, we stopped that. They stopped throwing them out in a certain place. Yeah, they were 35 millimeter films. Mm -hmm. And some of them were $100,000 films. Right. My films were 25,000 to 45,000 and they were real films. I mean, they mm -hmm. were, you know, women who could act, men who could try and act, um, solid sex scenes, solid stories that would hold up, that would win awards, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff. So um, I think people really appreciated that. I mean, to this day, I have hundreds of fans who write to me and say, you did this scene with so-and-so, and you know what, Jesus, I can't fucking remember who it was. Right. I did thousands of scenes. I'd right. like to remember. Mm -hmm. I can't. And um, I just try and steer them in a direction. But over the years, you know, we went to beta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't even believe it. And then video, mm -hmm. and then DVD. Mm -hmm. And DVD kind of crushed us. I mean, we got crushed with people who did amateur and et cetera, et cetera. But in the beginning, there was a, it was like ninety nine dollars a tape. What's interesting is back then the performers could actually act. Yes. So they were hired not just for their sex scene, but also because they could actually act and had some type of background you had as an actor to be able to act. And a lot of people in the industry then, as opposed to now actually had some type of real background in the mainstream entertainment industry. And today they don't, they're just recruited from all types of places. Um, the film quality now has really degraded to the point where they're no longer shooting on film. They're using digital, everything's digitalized now. There's no more stories, there's no more actors. Um, it's just shot basically from the hip uh, with no story. And that's what made those films interesting back then. There was actually a story so um, knowing what I know about the industry, like every industry, I've educated myself in every facet of the business, a mainstream and non-mainstream. But uh, back then, I know a lot of situations and scenes, they would not use protection. Oh, well, that's a big thing. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up because I consider myself the luckiest person on earth mm -hmm. never got HIV mm -hmm. and when it came up um, one of our actors Jonathan he got AIDS and he came to me and he said I'm infected I said well you know you're done you're done here mm -hmm. and he said I know I don't know what I'm going to do I said well if you want to produce for me you know or hang around or whatever I'll pay you you know, what I can pay you, I don't know what that is, a couple hundred a week just to get yourself settled. So I called the meeting, they called me the Norma Ray of porn, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And Norma Ray was a person who fought for rights. It was, there was a movie about her and uh, wouldn't let her work. And, and, and that happened to me. Um, there was a huge meeting and I got this guy, Jonathan, to come to the meeting and he said, I have HIV. And I said to everybody, look, we have to wear condoms. And they were like, fuck you, Ona, you know what you're talking about. And I was blackballed mm. for about three months just before I had my own company. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you guys do what you want to do, but 
I'm going to start an AIDS mobile. And at that time, I knew this plastic surgeon very well. And he went in with me and we had a mobile unit. And so we would drive around the valley mm -hmm. and we would take AIDS tests and it grew from there. So to the point where you had to have a clean AIDS test before you shot a movie. Wow. I don't remember, like now I know I'm having hip surgery next week, mm -hmm. but I have to take a test on Saturday. The surgery's on Monday. So it's 48 hours. Mm -hmm. So then I think it was like before every movie, but I, I wrote up, I had my lawyer write up a disclaimer. Mm -hmm. If you do not choose to wear condoms, that's on you. You cannot come back to me and sue me. Right. If you choose to wear condoms, that's great. And you just sign this line and say, I choose to wear condoms. Anything happens, it breaks or whatever, it's on me, mm -hmm. on the person. Mm -hmm. And I had a big bowl of condoms and whatever. And I said, and there used to be for lesbian scenes, the face shields and mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. And finally, they got it. And Sherry Mitchell, who is a horrible person, decided she was going to take over the AIDS wagon. Wow. And she pushed me out. And you know what? It was okay as long as people were getting the test. Mm -hmm. And I remember trying to talk to her at one point. She was screaming at me, mm. you know, I know she's a major drug addict. You have nothing to do with this, you know, go away, whatever. And I was like, okay, Sharon, as long as you're doing the right thing, yeah. Um, but that was a big, big push. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was horrible. And I oh, used to be right back. Yeah, but I'm just telling you, I'll, I'll repeat it. Yeah. I used to go. For Hey folks, this is Wolfie D here. And if you are looking to buy or sell a home in Tennessee or Southern Kentucky, you're going to want to call my buddy, the rock star realtor, Benji Bowie. And you say, Wolfie, how do I get in touch with this rock star? Well, you can call him directly at 615-390-8216. You can go to his website, BowieHomes.com. That's B-U-I-E Homes.com. Or you can email him at BenBowie34 at gmail.com. B-E-N-B-U-I-E 34 at gmail.com. When you need a home, you need the Rockstar Realtor. Tell him Wolfie sent you. Benji is a member of Exit Realty's Garden Gate team in Gallatin, Tennessee. That's right, folks. Canine Corral for all your dog daycare and overnight care. Call 631-549-549. 1544. That's 631-549-1544. You want to star in your own success? Call QuickCast, www.quickcast.com, 866-7-CAST-NOW. That's 866-7-CAST-NOW, QuickCast. Star in your own success. So ladies and gentlemen, we're back with the O spots. Um, you're talking about Sharon Mitchell and her basically causing issues for you because you wanted to implement condoms and safe practices well, for she, adult films. She wanted to take it over from me. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't have a problem with that because I was so frighteningly busy trying to get out, you know, five movies a week, which for me became impossible. But I mean, you know, like Vivid, they get, I don't know, 20 movies a week out. I don't know what they do anymore. But um, I had called her about something. I, oh yeah, I know what it was. Mm -hmm. I had a breast infection and I got sepsis and I was taking so many antibiotics and the doctor at Cedars was asking me about the situation and she said, we'd really like some help with our, this was like at the beginning, with our um, units downstairs. Could you call the person you know? Okay, I'm sitting in their office. I'm trying to talk to Sharon and she is, I mean, the phone is, out to here mm -hmm. she's screaming at me you bitch i'm like sharon these are doctors and they need some information can right. you 
I am not giving you shit. Mm. And, and so I looked at my doctor and I said, this is, this is the problem. Mm -hmm. She said, okay, I got it. We'll get it from somewhere else. Now, I, I don't know if they did or not. I was, you know, after a few months I was healed, I had um, staph infection. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's kind of where that went. Mm -hmm. But uh, as long, I, I do believe that you are still required to have an AIDS test. Yeah, it may not be for every shoot, but I do think that people are still using condoms. I have a very good friend, Raven Touchstone. She's like the best writer in the business, and I think she is aware of what's going on. So I'll find out for next time, and I'll let you know. So what was the testing policy back then? Like if you came on set, obviously you were already tested. If you didn't have a test, you didn't work. Okay. Not for me. Okay. If there were other people who didn't care, but if you didn't have a test, I'm sorry. I was like, I'm really sorry. I know you need the money, but I, mm -hmm. it was always about, I need the money. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'll give you a hundred dollars. You got to get tested. Mm -hmm. And I would call the car, you know, the, the, AIDS car and say, I got somebody here who's not tested. Can you get over here? And they were really busy. They only had the one car at the time. Now they have several mobile cars, but you could also go, he's in Culver City mm -hmm. and get tested right there. It was a short turnaround like it is now. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, how can you do this to yourself? Mm -hmm. What's wrong with you? And they were drugged up. Mm -hmm. That's what was wrong with them. They mm -hmm. couldn't think straight. Mm -hmm. And that's still the problem mm -hmm. the drugs so i mean i would be like i can get a mobile car here in several hours but i don't know if i can save your scene i'm sorry and they were really mad at me they made me out to be a witch a bitch or this or that and the other and a lot of people thought i was just horrid and i just did what i needed to do to survive so you stood for change and kind of at that time was a negative atmosphere because producers were taking advantage of the performers. Oh yeah. So was that a culmination of you creating your own production company or how did that end up to where you say, I'm tired of working for other producers and taking advantage no, of No, I, I wanted to, I, I always like to work for myself. So mm -hmm. I wanted to work for myself and I finally had made enough money to produce this learning the ropes and man, it swept the nation. It was, it's still the best selling bondage series in history. And uh, we made enough money to start my own company. Mm -hmm. And I was tough because people had been very tough on me. And uh, we can get into that next show. Mm -hmm. You should maybe. How, far, uh, how long were you in the business though, is what I want to know. Uh, before I started before my own Before you company? started your own production company. You know, I'd like to say at least four years. Okay. Uh, because the men in that group that we all know about mm -hmm. didn't want any women. Okay. And I broke through and it took a long time for them to trust me. And, mm -hmm. you know, don't, you know, it was like, don't ever say this, don't ever say that, don't do this, don't do that. And, it was very dangerous to speak out. And um, there was one man who I've already spoken about who said to me, don't mm -hmm. ever mm -hmm. talk about it. And I said, well, I have no reason to mm -hmm. because I know the consequences mm -hmm. and the consequences are death. And you know, I, I I wrote with you, I started to write a book right. and we sent it off to this literary agent. I don't know how well you knew him, but he was only interested in the business of the business. Mm -hmm. And I, I called him back and I said, so you really want to see me get killed? That mm -hmm. is your main objective. Then you can write the book and make a million dollars. I'm not willing to do that. Exactly. Understand your safety is number one always. God, family, and health. Um, and what I love about you is that you're spiritual. And what I also love about you is you're wise and you're educated. So when you came into the business where you kind of looked upon as giving advice to young performers, because like everybody at that time was way younger. Yeah, I, I was looked upon as like someone who was spiritual, 
wise older and mm -hmm. i remember i was already sober mm -hmm. so they would do a, a lot of these kids would do horrible things like i mean cocaine was my drug of choice mm -hmm. i mean i i can still have a drink if i want but you know i'm very spiritual i choose not to right. so once in a while my husband and i it'll be our anniversary june 3rd we may go have mexican food and have a little margarita but i i'm like an indian i can only have like that much and i'm <laughs> out of it i'm like passed out under the table so and it's not a big deal to me so mm -hmm. they would have a lot of drugs mm -hmm. and i'd go to my q line which you know is the mark and they would run cocaine lines go ahead ona won't hurt you wow. and or they'd put cocaine in their mouth mm -hmm. like you know people eat it and then kiss me mm -hmm. now i never thought i had to start my program over because it wasn't my fault mm -hmm. but i'd have to go brush my teeth wash my mouth out and start over mm -hmm. and i thought that was just rude i mean i didn't say yell or scream or whatever i just took it for what it was immaturity mm -hmm. and since then so many of them have come back to me who are now in the program and have said, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, whatever, it's over. Mm -hmm. It's just, you wouldn't do that to someone now. Mm -hmm. That Being, part was hard. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure because uh, there are every, everybody in that industry up to that point was being told, you can do this, you can do this. It won't hurt you. That won't hurt you. You're fine. You can do whatever you want to do. And there was no rule. Boundary. Safeguard. Yeah, no boundaries, no safeguard. Um, probably, and I know I've talked with you about him before, but probably to me, and I'm 42, so I'm still semi young. The most young. famous male performer ever in the adult film industry was John Holmes. And I don't think you ever had any experiences with him. I didn't. Okay. You know, John was crazy. He, I'll never forget seeing a film where he actually took a shit on the floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you ever see that one? Mm -mm. Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, they were like high on, on, you know, acid or something. And he's in a circle. He's in San Francisco. And, you know, I just thought that, you know, what else could you have done, John? Right. And um, he was a freak like Ron Jeremy. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of felt bad for him. Right. You know, but he was so famous. And I don't know what he did with his money. I don't think he had any money at the end. No. Did he? He spent a lot of it on drugs, uh, a lot of it on just women. Women, yeah. You know, um, he didn't actually become infected with AIDS from oh, but he did. the mainstream adult industry. He actually did a gay film and he contracted AIDS from the gay film. So that's how he caught it. It was from the adult industry, but I'm saying it wasn't from the mainstream films in the adult industry was the sub genre of gay films that actually contracted AIDS through doing a male scene with another male performer. Mm -hmm. That's how he contracted AIDS. And there was, there's been movies produced on his life. I mean, uh, Oh yeah. Wonderland with Val Kilmer, Val Kilmer played John Holmes in the movie. And then, uh, they Mark did Wahlberg. Mark Wahlberg, uh, Boogie Nights with Mark Wahlberg, semi biographical on John Holmes and, uh, Nina Hartley, who was one of your, contemporary performers in the industry she was in that movie um but it's just it's an interesting it's an interesting tale it's a precautionary tale of you know be careful what you ask for you might just get it right you know, that's, that's right yeah and you know nina um for some reason does not like me i don't know why mm -hmm. she is getting older she's probably in her 60s and she had to ask had to ask her fans for money to have a tumor removed and the woman should not be working at this point mm -hmm. i don't know what she's doing but um she left her husband again and is in another three way i know she's a very strange person but um but the, so the era you guys you specifically were in the um, silver era silver era of adult films do you feel that producers were fair in their compensation to the performers or do you feel that the producers really exploited the performers i think tim it really depended on who it was like anthony spinelli mm -hmm. was one of my best friends when i got in the business my last name was zimmerman 
and uh, my first husband, and he, he said to me, oh my God, I already love you, but you know, you can't change your name. I said, watch me. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, you know, we're going to film this week. So you come up with something. And if I like it, we're on. So I came up with Z and he said, perfect. And I think I shot every film he ever made from that point on with him. And he catered to me. Mm -hmm. He did everything for me. He, his son and his wife. And they were just typical porno family, but they were wonderful. Now, someone like, what was his name? Someone else, horrible. Mm -hmm. You could be in the middle of a scene. Mm -hmm. You're already making $500 or whatever. I'll think of his name. Mm -hmm. and, and he would stop and whisper in your ear, if you do an anal right now, I'll give you 50 bucks more. Mm -hmm. I'm like, are you out of your mind? Wow. And this happened. And then I used to, John, uh, Ron Jeremy used to shoot a few films. So I said, all right, I'll shoot with you one time. So I went to Palm Springs we, or Vegas and we drove out in the middle of the desert. When I tell you nothing was there, not even a bottle of water. Mm -hmm. um, he paid us $200 mm -hmm. to have sex in the sand, mm -hmm. no bathroom no water wow nothing i said ron this is the last mm. time i'm ever going to see you mm -hmm. i mean this is he he's getting his comeuppance mm -hmm. this is what he deserves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean those kind of people and this other guy his name was john something mm -hmm. he um has i think mouth cancer okay I mean, these guys who thought they were so hot, so wonderful and whatever now are suffering. Right. Did you see, um, was there a trend ever in the business with certain female talent that would go on self-destruction paths of life? Like, I know they would like contribute in drugging, partying on set. But as far as like, did you see, I guess my question is, did you see was there many girls in the industry that would commit suicide or oh, overdose from drugs or that's that what, type of thing? That's what our book's about. Right. And um, the first one, when I first got in, this woman, darling, Megan, mm -hmm. she shot herself mm -hmm. with a shotgun. Mm -hmm. She was high. And somehow I'm thinking she comes from a religious family. I, I don't really remember, but she was very high. Mm -hmm. and from that point on more and more women and Amal uh was so high she got in a car accident in vegas and was mm -hmm. you know disappeared mm -hmm. um i mean more and more and more women killed themselves now i remember savannah had a car accident and disfigured her face and then i remember hearing the story that she committed suicide and then i think Cal Jammer was a male performer in the he industry. Himself. Shot himself because Jill Kelly left him. Mm -hmm. Wow, he was in a phone booth. So there were was that kind of a prevalent thing? Like there were adult performers in the business, but they would have relationships within the industry with other performers. Mm -hmm. Was that a prevalent thing? Yeah. Okay. And like uh, John Doe was married and to this woman, and they were splitting up, and John was raised on dope and he hung himself wow so i mean it can go in all ways but more and more and i have this little fellow who's a fan of mine from uh pittsburgh or pennsylvania and he clues me in because i don't follow it anymore mm -hmm. and he tells me oh my god ona um john doe just died or this woman just shot herself or this girl od'd or and i mean it's constant it's like mm -hmm. every seven to ten days mm -hmm. and that's when i i spoke to you and i said this book needs to be about how do you get out of the business without committing suicide without being with, with basically being unscathed without permanent Damage. mental issues or damage from being exploited or abused or that type of thing so uh well they've already been abused yes they've been abused but at some point there's a silver lining 
where they need to say, okay, I've had enough. I respect myself too much to keep going through this. But that's when you realize you need to get out. Yeah. And they can't, they can't get to that point. There's something wrong there. I mean, it took me years in therapy to get out. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have to admit that. And part of it is the makeup, the clothes, the jewelry, like Jenna Jameson, she invested all of her money in diamonds. Mm -hmm. There's no payoff. Wow. You know, I had a $12,000 diamond that I needed to sell at one point. I got four grand for it. Mm. So what's the payoff? Right, exactly. Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, I would, t I would tell them. Uh, yeah, I'll break the game. Are we? Mm -hmm.